Thank you very much uh, for coming. My name is Kate Wittenberg, and I'm the managing director of Portico. And my colleagues here, Tim DeLauro from the Data Conservancy at Johns Hopkins and Ken Rawson of IEEE, are going to tell you about a project that we've been working on uh, this past year and that will be going on for a little more than another year. Um, I will give you the overview and introduction to everything. Then Tim will talk in more detail about the technical work that we're doing. And then Ken will talk about uh, an important component of our work, which is the community engagement and outreach um, that we're focusing on. Uh, and then we'll have time for people to ask questions and have discussion. So uh, we're calling this the RMAP project, um, short for research map. And th the goal of this project is to engage with a much broader um, set of changes and developments that are happening within the scholarly communications environment. Um, these are, are driven, and our work is driven, by a need to respond to a change in the whole definition of um, articles, the publications that um, result from research in the article form. Um, in, in the past, um, the article has been primarily a uh, text with some graphics or data that was usually indicated by a citation. I increasingly, this, uh, the primary unit of scholarly communication is becoming much more complicated. It's becoming multi-part distributed object that more often than not includes data and sometimes software. The elements of this new kind of publication may reside in different repositories maintained by different institutions employing different technologies. So the goal of, of the project that we're doing is to maintain and preserve the connections among these various components of this increasingly complex scholarly object. An important part of our project is the partnership um, that's at its base. And we believe that our respective institutions represent important pieces of this whole picture. And so it's important to us and to the project that we're um, already involved with each of these areas. The Data Conservancy, as most of you know, has tremendous expertise in management of large data archives from multiple disciplines. IEEE has expertise in management of data-intensive scholarly journal publications, perhaps more so than, than any other publica publisher. And Portico has expertise in digital preservation in the workflow requirements of our publishers, um, which now number 275 um, different kinds of publishers. So we, we bring in that expertise. The overall work plan for this project, which as I mentioned is two years, is in year one, we have uh, what we're calling the planning phase. And during this time, we're working to gather requirements, create um, use cases. Um, we've held a workshop with stakeholders in the community, which was very useful and very important in gathering feedback at an early stage of the project when we can and have made changes in our planning rather than getting w feedback too late to do that sort of change. Um, and, we, and we're refining the scenarios based on this feedback. So by the end of this year, we want to have um, enough specs so, so that we can move into year two, which is going to be focused on development of a prototype in which we're creating a system to identify, store, update, and retrieve relationships among publications and new forms of scholarly output, including, as I mentioned, data and software that will be attached to the article. The outcomes and deliverables for this work, we expect to be um, a working prototype of the RMAP tool, existing um, and plans for future collaborative partnerships with the community, and by that I mean 
um, data repositories, publishers, libraries, and perhaps individual researchers, the, the different stakeholders for the work that we're doing. A system that supports emerging forms of digital scholarship and publishing as we move forward and a plan for sustainability of the project beyond the grant funding that we've received to start this up and develop it during these first two years um, from the Sloan Foundation. And we'll be talking and thinking more about the sustainability plans as we have a better sense of how the project itself is developing. So now I'm going to turn things over to Tim, who, as I said, will talk more about the technology work behind this project. Thank you, Kate. So I'd like to start with some, some key objectives that we looked at from the technology perspective. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with uh, some of the bigger services in the scholarly communication environment. Uh, our bigger publishers, Crossref, uh, now Datasite. One of the things that we wanted to be able to do was to support uh, assertions into this environment from players who are, are not necessarily part of those uh, big groups. Um, we wanted to be able to, uh, to include the results that come into our map as part of the linked data environment. And while we do want to have input from these uh, smaller players potentially or even individuals like authors eventually making assertions about uh, the entities that they create. Uh, we do want to be able to leverage data that exists in uh, existing environments like those of publishers and Crossref, uh, software repositories, data repositories, um, and the authors. And we also wanted to be able to deal with uh, resources like textual citations or uh, named authors who don't have any identity associated with them and at least provide some level of support for those within this environment. Uh, so based on those objectives, we uh, developed a data model. And this is a, a very simplified version of that data model. I hope at least some of you can see it. If not, it, it'll be in the slides. I'm going to walk through them uh, or walk through the elements of this data model a little bit and, and talk about some of the key components of it. <coughs> so the first thing I want to talk about is the concept of a resource. I think we can all understand what that is from our understanding of the web. A resource is a, a thing that can be identified with a URL or a URI in the web. It's, it's one of the web's basic building blocks. Um, and it is a key entity for uh, description and retrieval within the web. So uh, within, this, within this environment, we are uh, focusing on a model that supports linked data and is based on RDF, or at least the concepts, the concept of a graph that's supported by RDF. And uh, resources form uh, uh, the subjects uh, especially and uh, objects and predicates in RDF triples or in relationships in the graph. Uh, and I'll also note that uh, while resources called out specifically, uh, other entities in this model are also resources, and they have they support the semantics of resources as well. Uh, the next concept is this concept of the RDF triple, which is uh, a building block of the semantic web, uh, and is conceptually of the form. Uh, subject, predicate, and object, which is very similar to subject, verb, object in English. And it's the way uh, resources are described in the semantic web.
we also introduce a new concept called a disco. Uh, and uh, we have nice icons that are disco balls to, to represent these uh, entities in, in some of our sketches. Uh, and this disco is it's a, a distributed scholarly compound object. And the, the idea here is that if you're familiar with uh, OAI, ORE, uh, resource maps, uh, these kinds of entities are very similar to aggregations uh, in the OAI ORE. Um, and I have a, a little example that I can show. So the idea here is that within the blue lines, uh, we have the compound object itself. Uh, and within the red line, we have the entire disco. So the compound object represents an assertion by whoever is uh, asserting this disco uh, of the compound, op what they consider part of the object. The other two uh, entities in this sketch are sort of the tentacles. You can think of the, them as tentacles into the semantic web so that this compound object doesn't sit by itself. It has connections into the broader web. And so this is very similar to uh, OAI, ORE aggregations, um, as described in a resource map, as I said, uh, without some of the uh, constraints that uh, OAI, ORE imposes. But our discos can be expressed as ORE resource maps. So uh, just a little example of of what this enables us to do. Uh, in, this, in this sketch, we have uh, a, a couple of entities that are being held in a software repository uh, and a data repository and in a publishing system where the, an article is being published, the article A2, and uh, the data set associated with that D2 may have been built specifically for that article. Uh, but you can see in this sketch that D2 was derived from D1, and D1 is sitting somewhere else in a data repository. Uh, you can also see that, uh, that D2 was the output of some software program, which is sitting in a software repository. So one of the things that we can do with our map, if each of these entities is pushing uh, their discos into our map. Uh, an identi identity provider like ORCID could come along later and based on uh, the identity of the creator C2, harvest information out of our map without knowing that it, without having to visit each of those other software repositories, data repositories or publishers. A uh, couple more entities within our model. Uh, we have the concept of an agent, which is a, a person or thing uh, or group of things, uh, an organization, for example, that is responsible for some action that is happening. Uh, and we make the distinction in our model between a scholarly agent, someone associated with uh, the creation or modification of a scholarly artifact like an article or a data set, uh, versus someone who is doing actions within the system, the RMAP system, and that, that kind of agent is called a system agent within RMAP. For example, a, a user would be considered a system agent within RMAP. And finally, uh, events. Uh, one of the things that we want to be able to do within RMAP is capture provenance, to know when things happened and who did what within the system. So, so that we have a good sense of, uh, f from the event information, we would be able to reconstruct uh, the, the model, the graph, at any point in time, for example, uh, so that in the future, we might be able to, to see the state at different times. So next, I'm going to talk about our our APIs, uh, 
we've decided to use REST APIs and in the past in some of our projects we've, we've done things like going down the path of, of Java APIs uh, and we're going to do that underneath but one of, one of the lessons we've learned is that we need to expose information in a very lightweight way uh, and so one of the, ben the benefits of uh, this approach are that we are programming language independent and we don't need to be tightly bound to the underlying model. The model can change uh, often in, in ways that we don't have to uh, expose, we don't have to break our APIs each time the model changes. Uh, and a few of the decisions that we've made related to how we do this implementation is that we will include uh, versions within our API paths so that over time as uh, as we evolve our APIs, it will be very obvious to the users of those APIs that they have changed and they won't have surprises when they go to dereference some, some object. Uh, we also decided that we're not going to be bound uh, by uh, HTTP verbs within that model and we want to we wanna be flexible enough to do things in, that will make it easier for users of the APIs and not be dogmatic about how those are applied. Uh, one thing I didn't mention here is that we've also decided that uh, any access through the APIs will be controlled at least by an API key, even for read kinds of operations. So some registration will be required um, so that we can have some control over how people are using the system, especially when the system is full of triples. It could be very expensive to operate. <coughs> Uh, so, this, this slide is just meant to give a, a little example of uh, the, the APIs that we're supporting. You can see that they are focused on either retrieval based on uh, resource identity or creation and update modification based on the discos. Uh, the retrieval of the resources will be driven by the set of active discos at any moment in time. So discos can be uh, uh, ingested into the system and they can be replaced in the system and as they're replaced they become inactive. Uh, we have methods to get at the inactive resources as well but primarily uh, uh, consumers would be getting resources related to active discos. Uh, so, one approach that's, that's often taken, or an initial approach that's often taken in, in API development is to specify the paths of the APIs. Uh, uh, we started down that approach and what we found is that uh, it's really important to talk about the behaviors of the APIs even before you start talking about what the resource paths of the APIs look like. Uh, so we didn't do that at the beginning and we're circling back to do that now. They really should come first and uh, so that's another lesson learned uh, that we're taking away. Uh, so then we're looking at API paths, uh, the data models that are associated with the APIs, which can be slightly different from the underlying data model serialization of those models so uh, you know if we're uh, sending out an ORE uh, something in an ORE model we might serialize it as Atom or RDF XML or JSON LD for example and then implementations associated with those so this is uh, you know another eye chart but this is uh, an example that shows some of the behaviors within a particular API. This one is uh, updating a disco. Uh, and so articulating the, the behaviors themselves, what the requests look like, and what the responses look like. And this is one of the implementation uh, flowcharts that's been developed for um, uh, one of the API methods and uh, this is, it's in swim lanes. This one is kind of swim lanes without goggles on, so your eyes are really blurry and you probably can't see it. Uh, and here's a call out that's maybe a little bit better of a, a little chunk of that. 
Um, but you can see that there's quite a lot of work uh, that goes into the specification of, of the implementations uh, for these. Uh, so for API coverage, uh, as I mentioned before, our current focus is on APIs that populate and support access to the graph, and we'll, future focus will be on authentication and authorization, administra other administrative functions, uh, supporting the, an inference engine so that you don't have to know uh, the exact, uh, the exact uh, property or relationship that you're looking for, but you might be able to find it through broader or narrower terms, and operability of the system. So being able to keep the system running and understand the state of the system and whether it's working properly. <coughs> and lastly, uh, uh, I'll just mention that uh, the technical team activity, uh, we've developed an initial data model, as I mentioned. Uh, we're specifying and prototyping <coughs> APIs. Uh, members of our, our group are participating in the RDA, uh, Research Data Alliance, data publishing working groups and interest groups. Uh, and we plan to have an initial prototype uh, platform of, of the work that we're doing in March of next year. And now I'll turn it over to Ken for community. Good morning, I'm Ken Rawson from the IEEE. Um, I'm going to give you all a chance to take a deep breath from that technology deep dive that uh, Tim was doing and kind of back out a little bit and uh, talk about the community aspects of this project and, um, you know, go into a little more detail, uh, you know, following up on Kate's overview. So um, the scholarly article is still the, the primary form of scholarly communication and I think in this day and age uh, that's, you know, the printed journals and also uh, PDF representations of articles on uh, you know, various repositories, publishers, websites, and the like. But um, that article is becoming more complex, uh, you know, following up on what Kate said, um, with many, many, many more connections, uh, links, uh, you know, emphasis on data, particularly in the hard sciences and large data sets, uh, and relationships among all these pieces. And um, that's becoming very, very difficult to do to get an understanding of the scholarly article um, as this complexity builds and grows. And we think that's where our map can come in and serve a useful purpose. So this is a different visualization of a uh, scholarly article, uh, it's, you know, a different view of what Tim presented. And just the idea here is that there are a lot of different interconnections and interconnected pieces, uh, potentially, of an article. And this gives you a, a visualization of the scope or footprint of an article, uh, which can lead to some very interesting uses of this data. So um, in terms of the role that RMAP can play in the STM community, um, that's a role of an aggregator or pulling together all these disparate pieces of information about scholarly articles uh, in one place because this information is available in a lot of different sources and silos um, but it's, you have to go to all these different places to see it and uh, it's hard to get a sense of a complex article from lots of little bits of pieces. Um, and we think by RMAP pulling this together and describing these relationships among the parts of an article is going to help enhance scholarly communication. So uh, in terms of the RMAP community, uh, we've been talking to publishers, authors, funders, data repositories, librarians, uh, and we're beginning discussions with others, uh, Crossref, Datasite, Dryad, Pangea, Wiley, ACM, uh, among others at this point. So. We're really reaching out and trying to engage the STM community and the scholarly community um, to bring them into this project and see the value of it. And we really need to do that because um, our map's only going to be useful if people submit data to it and then uh, use that data in interesting ways. 
Um, and the, the value is going to come from the community. And it, it's really important that everybody be involved. And as Kate mentioned, we held a workshop in October in New York City. I think there were between, what, 25 and 30 participants from all areas of the STM community uh, to get their feedback and their thoughts on this project and where it's going and its usefulness. So some feedback we got from that workshop um, is that uh, they felt that our map should be a meta uh, service or clearinghouse, which uh, we think makes a lot of sense uh, in capturing all this data in one place. And accessing that, um, Tim talked about, would be you know through APIs and various linkage mechanisms so that people could pull this data and make it useful. Um, we, they're helping us refine our use cases and defining the goals of the project more tightly and we're working on that. Um, this was very useful. And it was very clear that uh, you know, they didn't think we should replicate others' work and we absolutely agree with that. We want to build on what other people are doing uh, and, and kind of pull that together and integrate with others. So some other things that uh, the workshop participants provided for us uh, they were talking about the challenge of secondary data and inferred relationships, and we think that's really a sweet spot for our, our map because um, that's not really being done at all right now. Um, folks are talking about this, but I don't think anyone's really, you know, has an, you know, actively working on this, and that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're really trying to do. Um, they felt that uh, RMAP having an established publishing partner uh, in the IEEE was important. Um, and they, they thought that uh, we might focus on the input side uh, in terms of software and research wor workflows um, and really gather content about articles and scholarly communication. So uh, we're having an ongoing dialogue with the folks uh, that <coughs> participated in the workshop uh, we want to reach out to other people. This is certainly you know, not exclusive. This is an open, transparent project. Uh, we really need to engage uh, more deeply with the STM community if this is going to be successful. And uh, with your help, we think it will be. So uh, these are the team members that are working on the project. Uh, we have Saeed uh, Chowdhury and Tim DeLauro from the Data Conservancy, Conservancy at Johns Hopkins. Um, Several folks, including me, from the IEEE, uh, an extensive team from Portico uh, with Kate. And uh, we very much want to thank uh, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their generous support for this project. Um, and you know, we thank the workshop participants for really uh, helping us with this. So we think this is a going concern. We're working very hard on this, but its value is going to be proved by the community. So. Uh, with that, I open the floor to questions for Kate, Tim, for me, for all of us. You can just point out the website where people uh, can get yes. lots of information. So this is the project website. There are a number of documents on there. We update it regularly, and we invite you to, uh, you know, please go there periodically because they, they, it is changing. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank you.